So welcome everybody. This is GoLab. You already know that because you have a badge. And I just want to say mille gracias a tutta gli organizzatori. Thank you very much. So all the organizers, let's give them a big round. A lot of love goes into this conference. So I am Ron Evans. In the real world, some people call me dad. But on the internet, I am dead program. On Twitter, on GitHub, all the places that matter. Bitbucket. Um, so I uh, am the ringleader of a consultancy called The Hybrid Group. We do software for hardware companies. So when I saw there was a whole track of Embedded here, I got really excited because like, there's now three of us. So uh, we do work for clients like Intel and a little company in Boulder, Colorado called Sphero that became very well known all of a sudden because of a movie about wars and the stars. And that's all I'm allowed to say. Pretend like you didn't see that logo. Shh. So we're really well known for a bunch of open source projects. Uh, the most well known in the Go community are GoBot, which is a framework for creating physical applications, drones, robotics, and the Internet of Things. And then most recently in the last year, a project called GoCV. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So GoCV lets you use OpenCV from the Go programming language. So, OpenCV, if you're not familiar with it, you might be, you probably are. It is a framework for developing computer vision applications that literally has hundreds of algorithms for computer vision uh, feature analysis, for filtering. Uh, it has a whole bunch of patent-free algorithms and also a bunch of patented algorithms if you use another part of it but it is by far the most popular and the most mature of all of the open source computer vision tools. So GoCV lets you use this from the Go programming language. So why do you want to use, also you can use it using Intel's OpenVINO. OpenVINO is a package from Intel that lets, includes some special Intel specific hardware optimization. So it's open CV plus some additional hardware acceleration and tools. So just a very quick review. What is computer vision? Well, computer vision can detect motion for security and surveillance types of applications, among other applications. Recognize people for friendly or unfriendly types of purposes. Telepresence which is when you are as if you were somewhere else, perhaps on another planet, like the planet Mars, where in my old hometown of Los Angeles, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they control actual rovers on the planet Mars. Not just make movies about Mars, but actual robots on Mars. Autonomous vehicles. You've got planes, trains, automobiles, and my personal favorite, quadcopters. And then augmented humans. And by that, I don't mean a silly superhero movie, even though uh, Tim O'Reilly said the purpose of the Internet of Things is to give humans superpowers. But to me, a superpower might be when your doctor can look at the radiology report and determine that there's something that needs additional analysis, the kind of superpowers that save people's lives. Those are the kind of augmented humans I want to see. So why you should use Go for computer vision? Well, the you come for the concurrency. We, all, all, any of us who have been using Go for a little while know that the CSP model that is built into Go as in the form of language primitives is a great way to write concurrent software. So you come for the concurrency and you stay for the portability, cross-compiling to different architectures and operating systems, and then the performance, especially starting with Go 1.8. It's amazing that the work that the Go core team and contributors have done, the garbage collection in Go, which was always the argument about don't use Go because it's garbage collected, once the garbage collector's worst case was reduced to less than 100 microseconds, not milliseconds, microseconds, now we're into the world of possibly real-time uh, computing. So come for the concurrency, stay for the performance. So how GoCV itself works. So you write your code in Go, then it calls into C Go, which calls C code, which calls C++ code. That sounds really complicated, right? Yeah, don't lie to me. That sounds really complicated. It is complicated. But we've hidden that all for you. 
Here is kind of a typical how the actual code you write using Go CV works. You write all your code in terms of just Go. And it's the same thing that you're doing when you're calling the Go standard runtime, where it's operating system specific, but that's all hidden for you. You don't need to care if you're on Windows or you're on Linux. So it's the same design pattern, but it's applied to a different set of libraries. So you write your code in Go, which calls Go CV's Go functions. So we've actually written idiomatic Go wrappers that directly map one-to-one -to, -one to Go to OpenCV's functions, but in a way that the parameters and the calling conventions and the naming and the Go docs all meet what you normally expect from a well-behaved Go package. That causes calls Go CV C functions, which then call into OpenCV itself. So it runs on Linux without any changes to your code. It runs on Mac OS without any changes to your code. And it runs on Windows. Yes, I said Windows. So who here actually uses Windows in their day job? Or ever? Right. Well, you may not care that much about Windows, but outside of our very rarefied, special, inclusive circle of open sourcey people, out in the real world, you know that horrible place that's scary and you don't like to go? Well, they use Windows. So we need to care about them because they are like us. They are also developers. So we need to make an effort to bring them into our community. All right, so let's, take a, let's get into some code. We've talked enough. So the, the hello world of video, I'll assume everyone here has already seen the hello world in Go. Um, so the hello world of video looks a little bit like this. So you've got your package main, the same as you have with any Go program. We're going to import Go CV from the gocv.io forward slash x forward slash gocv namespace. And then our main function, first we're going to call gocv.videocapture0. So that's going to open up camera 0, which is the default camera, the one that's built into my laptop, for example. Then we're going to call gocv.newWindow. That's going to open a GUI window using OpenCV's high GUI or high level graphical user interface. That way we can see what's going on. Then we're going to say image colon equals gocv.newMat. So that's where we're going to put the image. We'll talk more about mat in a minute. But let's just suffice to say that's where we're going to put the image that we capture from the camera. Then for ever, we're going to repeat. We're going to read from the webcam and place that into the pointer to the image because we're changing that image each time we run through. So to be properly idiomatic and go, we need to tell the programmer the thing that we're passing in is likely to be changed. It is mutable, right? Because normally when we pass things, we pass them by value and not by reference in Go. So we're just doing this so that you as a Go programmer understand what's happening. So then we call window.imshow, passing in that image. So that's going to show the image. And then we say gocv.wait key for one millisecond. So that gives us one millisecond to display the image, and then we'll skip on to the next. So if the demo gods are good, which sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. All right. So there I am. Look at that guy. <laughs> applause, yes. <laughs> Gratuitous applause. Thank you. All right, now let's go deep. Let's get into the matrix. All right, so what is a mat? So the mat is the fundamental data type you use with OpenCV and consequently with GoCV. So uh, just like a two-dimensional matrix is when you're doing a mathematical operation, it's the same sort of idea. It has dimensions and it has values. So an empty mat is just like the base plate of your Legos. There's nothing on it. It has no actual value. I like to explain everything important in life in terms of Legos. I hope you guys are OK with that. All right, so an empty mat is empty. There's nothing on it. It has no values. And we can test to see if mat is empty. Right? So if we want to represent a grayscale image, then we need to have a mat with two dimensions, right, an x and a y. And then each one of the elements needs to be a 16-bit integer. That way, we can represent all the different levels of gray that we have. OK, so far, so good? Now, if we wanted to represent a three, an RGB color image, then we need to represent that as a mat with two dimensions, an X and a Y. Each one of the elements is a 16-bit integer. But now we need to have three channels, one for the red, one for the green, and one for the blue. That way, so this is still a two-dimensional mat. Each one of the elements has the same value, 
It's a 16-bit integer, but now we have three channels. But we don't have to be limited just to that many dimensions. We could, for example, have a map, which is a 3D vector. This one, we have three dimensions, an X, a Y, and a Z. Each one of the elements is a floating point value, and it has two channels. For example, for an X and a Y, this is perhaps how we might represent a three-dimensional point cloud that we were constructing by analyzing 2D images and then constructing either using stereoscopic analysis or estimating them based on other types of feature analysis. So the mat is a very powerful thing, and that is the fundamental data type. So now let's take a look at five applications. This was going to be four, but we're going to have five because we're in the city of art. So five small applications written using GoCV. All right? First one is face tracking. <coughs> But you know what? Face tracking is not cool anymore, is it? Right? I'll tell you what's cool is face blurring. Now that is cool, right? That's the new, th that's the new thing. So uh, to do that, we have to recognize the face in order to blur it. And we're going to use something called a cascade classifier. So just very briefly, a cascade classifier is based on something that's called a Haar wavelet. It lets you take kind of like a Fourier transform. We can take and we can analyze any signal and separate it into one of four distinct categories as a way of classifying it. So two researchers, Viola and Jones, quite a few years ago, may have been back in the 80s, like before our times, right? Uh -huh. So uh, they figured out that you could take and you could apply these features. So if we take the Haar feature that is for eyes, it's a little darker here than the shiny part of your face where you're smiling. And we apply that to the face of my son Manolo. Then you see where we can actually have a match. Same idea, but applied to the nose. Your nose sticks out more than your cheeks, so it's a little brighter from the light. So we can take and we can apply these different features, and we can do a negative match, meaning no face is detected, and skip on to the next one. Or if we don't have a negative match, then we can continue cascading down and looking for faces. Or we could just use the GoCV.CascadeClassifier, classifier, which does all of this for us, thanks to OpenCV. So let's take a quick look at some code. We're going to go over this pretty quick, because we have a lot to cover. So package main, same as your normal Go program. We're going to import some standard packages, font, image, OS, and stirconv. Uh, and of course, GoCV as before. And it's kind of the same pattern as far as the application code. First, we're going to parse some parameters. That way, we know which camera to use and which recognizer file to use. We're going to open the webcam, same as before. This time, we'll check the error to see if there is one. And if so, then we'll print a message and get out. Otherwise, we'll call dev defer webcam.close. Because we are allocating C memory structures underneath the hood of this, like internally, we need to manage the memory ourselves. We can't just count on Go's own garbage collector because we could have unexpected side effects. So we need to, if we have a long-running program, we're going to need uh, to do a little more work to write a well-behaved application. So then we'll open the window, same as before. Same, defer, close the window when we're done. We're going to open an image map, same as before. Now we know what that is, right? This, we're going to close it. And then we're going to call GoCV.NewCascadeClassifier. That's going to allocate the OpenCV cascade classifier and assign it to this classifier variable. Then we'll load the XML file that corresponds to the recognition information about which faces it will be able to recognize. So then same pattern as before. You're going to see this a lot today. Forever, we read an image from the webcam. If it's empty, we just loop. Something went wrong with the camera, perhaps, and we'll just try again. Otherwise, we call classifier.detectMultiscale. That does that cascading classification, and it returns a slice of rects, a slice of regular Go image dot rects. That way, any Go program you've ever written that uses image dot rect, you already know how to use this because it's idiomatic Go. So then, once for each of the detected faces, we only want to blur the face itself, right? So we grab the region just of the face part. We don't want to blur the entire image. Has anybody here seen the new Microsoft uh, uh, Google Hangouts clone? It blurs your background, but not your face. That's going to be my next, so next time I do this, I'm going to switch it so it does it, because I want to copy them, copying me, copying them, copying me, copying them. <clears throat> anyway, so we get the image, and then we're going to call gocv.gaussianblur, which is going to perform the Gaussian blur on the face. 
and then we close the face. So we blurred just the face. Then we show the image with all the blurred faces, wait until someone presses a key or one millisecond passes, and then loop. All right, so again, if the demo gods have favored me, which you never really know, they do until they don't. All right. Hey, there's me, and I'm blurred. I was never really here. Plausible deniability. Let's see how that works on you guys. <laughs> yeah, none of you were here either. So if you were supposed to be somewhere and like you couldn't get there, you're covered. So you might notice a few things. If, if you turn your head to the side, it stops recognizing you and you're not blurred anymore. There are limitations to this particular type of algorithm, what we might call traditional computer vision. You're like, traditional computer vision? Wow, I just heard of computer vision. Now it's traditional? Yes. So this is, so there are limitations. Also, it takes more computational power the more faces that it attempts to recognize. So the more people in the crowd, the slower it gets. So thank you, people who didn't come in here. <laughs> who needed them? All right. So that is um, our demo for face blurring. All right, motion detection and tracking. So a uh, very typical kind of application is you want to detect motion. Uh, for example, you want to see if the neighbor's dog is the one sneaking into your backyard and eating your cat's food or vice versa, depending on your circumstances. So to do that, we're going to use something called background subtraction. So background subtraction uh, is we're going to use something that's known as a mixture of Gaussian. So quick review for the mathematically disinclined. So a Gaussian distribution is a normalized distribution, you know, the bell curve that you remember vaguely from statistics class when you weren't passing notes. So we can use a Gaussian distribution to determine if something fits within this distribution. We can perform something known as a mixture of Gaussian. That way we're actually doing this Gaussian normalization on the red, green, blue, and alpha channel, which is the transparency channel. So we can perform this to see any one of the colors that don't fit within the normalized range. Then we can perform that known as a running mixture of Gaussian. We do this for every single pixel, one after another. And the idea here is we can tell the things in the foreground which are moving versus the things in the background which are unchanging. Right? So that's what we're doing here. Or we can just call gocv.backgroundsubtractormob2. That's also an option. So that allows us to use the OpenCV functionality for performing this particular type of algorithmic calculation for us. So we're going to go really fast through this code because it's pretty much the same. Package main, import some of the Go standard packages, import Go CV. We have a constant, which is our minimum area in pixels that is necessary for triggering this. Make sure I've got the right camera plugged in. I have so many cameras. Yeah, seems like that'll work. Seems legit. Um, so our main function, same as before, we're going to parse some arguments. That way we can figure out which camera we're going to use if I have multiple cameras. Same thing as before, we open the video capture device. Same as before, we open a new window. This time we're going to have a few mats. We're going to have the mat that we're going to capture the image into, the delta, which is only the things in the foreground which are moving, we're going to have the image threshold because we're going to perform a threshold calculation. That way we can get rid of some of the extra noise that inevitably show up in these things, little artifacts. We don't, we don't want floating bits. We only want the cat or dog or human in this case. And then we're going to call gocv.new background subtractor mod2, which is what creates the open CV algorithm that we're going to be able to use. So same as before, forever read the camera into the image, then apply the algorithm using mod2.apply. And regardless of which algorithm you're using in OpenCV, it's to always apply. You apply the algorithm to a mat, and you get a mat as a result. This way, you can build whole chains of processing that use multiple different algorithms, potentially. So this puts the result into image delta. So then we're going to call gocv threshold so that we can clean up all of the extra artifacts. We're going to dilate it, which basically gets rid of any little gaps. That way we only have complete lines. And then we're going to go cv.find contours, which is going to find literally the outline around the part that's moving. So as long as that contour is actually big enough, 
our minimum that we put in before, then we're going to draw those contours into the image so we can see what's happening and then draw a rectangle around the whole thing so we can see here's the whole affected area and here are the contours within it that appear to be moving. Then we display a nice message, show it, and wait. All right, let's see if this works. All right, and the answer is yes. Wow, there's a lot of move. I can't hold still. I'm really I had coffee for lunch. And See, if we don't, only, if we don't have enough, it doesn't trigger the threshold. And if we have a lot, then it, like, it's really triggered. <laughs> kind of cool, right? Cyberdelia. I'll wait, just wait and see. All right, so that is our second demonstration. You can applaud in between. You don't, you're not burned out yet, I hope. All right, web video streaming. So basically, everything is boring unless you actually have video on the internet. So naturally, the main thing you want to do when you build a robot is you want it to be streaming or you put in the surveillance camera or whatever it is. So it turns out that you don't need any plugins or anything at all to display video in a browser. There's already a way to do this. It's called Motion JPEG. How are we doing on time, by the way? Minus 15. OK, cool. All right, so Motion JPEG. So this code is going to have a slightly different pattern. This time, we're going to use a Go routine. So same idea though, package main, import some standard packages. We're going to have the hybrid group mjpeg package, which is what does the encoding into the motion JPEG format. And then we're going to have GoCV itself. So we declared our camera and our stream in the form of pointers. That way, from both of our Go routines, we can access these two things. And our main function, same as before, we parse some arguments. We open the webcam. We mjpeg.newStream, that way we create the stream that we're going to put this into, and then we call go capture, which is going to launch in a separate go routine this capture function. Then we start our HTTP server, serving up the root as the stream itself, and then HTTP.listen and serve. This is exactly the same code you've ever seen if you've ever written any kind of web server with the Go standard library. So the capture, all it does is the code that we saw earlier, right? We just separated these two patterns into two different Go routines. It repeats forever. It grabs from the webcam. And as long as it has an image, it calls gocv.im encode, which puts into a slice of bytes the JPEG encoded information, because it's just a JPEG. Motion JPEG is just a series of JPEGs. It's just like a series of old style cartoon stills. And then we call stream.updateJPEG. So that then tells, for all of the current users of web browsers who attempt to get to this route, this is the JPEG to serve up. And then it keeps replacing that. So if, again, the demo gods are friendly today. So we're running it. We're saying use camera one. And we're saying use local host port 8080. All right, so now we're capturing. So as long as we point our web browser uh, to localhost 8080, there I am on the web. I'm on the internet, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Let's close that window. And it same logging you've ever seen before in every single Go program that used an HTTP server you've ever used before, it's just Go. And we see that I connected and I disconnected. All right. Style transfer using deep neural networks. So uh, because we're in the city, greatest city for art on Earth, I thought it was appropriate to introduce another demo. So we're going to go kind of quick, though. So this is going to use a deep neural network. So neural network is an artificial neural network, rather, is when you, in software, try to simulate mathematically the way that we think the synapses of the brain work. Right? That's not the same thing as how the synapses of the brain work, but it is a useful abstraction. So a deep neural network is a neural network where your inputs are not connected directly to your outputs, but you have one or more layers of these hidden nodes 
That way it's doing some additional types of processing on its way to the eventual output. So one of the things that you can do with this is something that's called style transfer. So if we take Starry Night from Van Gogh, I know it's Van Gogh, but Van, but humor me, it's a Go conference. So Van Gogh <laughs> uh, created this lovely work, Starry Night. And then there's this beautiful place called Chicago, which is where I was born, although not where I live now. But what if he had painted Chicago instead? It might look something like this. Ooh, how did you, who did this? Well, nobody. It was done by an artificial neural network using style transfer. So it's based on a paper called Perceptual Losses for Real-Time Style Transfer and Super Resolution, which is kind of the seminal work on this topic. And it's written using Torch. So it's the same pattern as we've seen before, right? Open the video capture device, open a window, open the map. In this case, we're going to read in the neural networks, the, the torch file, into GoCV because OpenCV lets us do deep neural network processing right within our Go code, right within our computer vision application. So we're going to grab the camera. We're going to convert the image into the blob format that all of these deep neural networks need, basically taking this combined RGB image for each element and separating all the reds, all the greens, all the blues, scaling it to a different size, in this case 640 by 480. We're going to feed that into the detector, and then we're going to do a pass through the detector, which lets the neural network execute. And then we grab from that the output. So this output here, we're going to take and we're going to it, all the reds, greens, and blues are separate. We're going to combine them back together here, and then we're going to show that in the window. And then we're going to close up our mats so that we don't have a memory leak and do it again. So, demo number five, or four, I don't know, whatever, some other demo, some number. Now, it's going to take a minute here because you'll notice this, this, this last parameter, I said FP32. So one of the things that we can do with OpenCV is we can tell it, I want to do the neural network processing, but I want to actually use the GPU to do this, right? So if you had the microphone was really close, you're about to hear my fan kick on. So it takes it a minute to start. It's saying it's not cached. And so there's me, Van Gogh style. And it has kind of a Velasquez meta painting quality because there's me talking about me showing the thing that's doing me. So it's <laughs> buenísimo. All right, time for our last demo. Object classification and tracking. Did I shut my program down? Yes, okay, good. Object classification and tracking with a deep neural network and a drone. Yes. So for this, we're going to use the DJI Tello. DJI is a very well-known Chinese drone company, not really known necessarily for its openness, but luckily a whole bunch of us didn't let that stop us. So there was probably about 10 different people in different languages, and we managed to hack the wireless UDP protocol that's used by the drone's flight commands and also video. Yes, I blogged about that. Um, it's kind of a long post. Uh, for me. Anyway, it uses a cafe network for doing the object tracking. It's actually built into OpenCV itself, and it's something that's called an SSD model. So single shot multi-box detectors work a little bit conceptually not unlike the cascade classifier. It's able to identify negative matches and then skip on. But one of the key differences is that it does not increase the computational requirements no matter how many faces we need to track or recognize. If there's a basic threshold needed for doing the computation of the deep neural network, and that's it. It doesn't require any more nor any less. So that's really one of the key tricks here. So we're going to be able to do all that with gocv.net, the same as what we did uh, a minute ago with the Starry Night. So this is a lot of code. We don't have time for all of it. Here's the key interesting parts. We're going to decode the video stream by running ffmpeg as a command line program. That way it's able to decode the H.264 video that the drone puts out, which I should turn on my stuff, huh? That would help. Otherwise, it's going to be kind of boring. Let's see if it, yes, OK, looking good so far. All right, so um, we're going to uh, have a Go routine, which is able to process my joystick. I'm going to use, uh, actually, this would be a good time to I 
way you can see what I'm talking about for the people who are not in our studio audience. So I'm going to use my Tello drone here, which is turned on. Yes, that's good. And I'm going to control it with my son's DualShock 4 controller, which I stole from him. I will return it, sort of, hopefully. All right, back to the code real quick. So that's what I'm going to control these things with. So we get different events from the drone. The most important one from our point of view here is that we're going to be getting the video from the drone. And each one of the video frames that we get from the drone, we're going to pass it through the motion JPEG, uh, or sorry, the H.264 MPEG decoder that's part of FFmpeg. Then our main routine is going to load the deep neural network that we're going to use for the facial tracking. Then forever, same as before. This time, instead of reading it directly from a camera, because the camera's in the drone flying around, we have to be able to take the decoded video and feed that through GoCV. And that's what we're doing here, is that we're converting that into bytes, and then we're going to pass it to this track face routine, and then we will show it in the window. So track face, it's very similar to what we saw with the Starry Night demo. We're going to convert the mat uh, to a blob, and then we're going to pass that to the neural, deep neural network to do some processing. And we're going to call net.forward to do the deep neural network processing. Then once we've gotten that data back, we're going to use that data to find the top, top left, bottom, and right of the human's face. And then as long as there is someone detected, we'll draw a rectangle around it. And then the interesting part, uh, besides takeoff and landing, is uh, when I hit the uh, circle button, the human face that's closest, it's going to follow them around because, you know, I need a paparazzi drone in my life. All right, so let's uh, first of all get the command. Let's switch over to the proper um, Wi-Fi, hopefully. Make sure everything's still awake. Yeah, look, so far so good. All right, so we're going to run this. Yeah, seems, seems legit. All right, so now it's running. And so there's the drone's eye view. Kind of boring right now. So I'm going to take the controller in one hand. So I'm going to turn on the drone's automatic launch. So I'm going to throw the drone. Oh, come on, that doesn't get even the tiniest applause. <laughs> oh, that's because it's not looking at you. Oh, yeah, there you people are. All right, so let's, uh, I wonder why it keeps trying to go. Oh, the battery's very low, that's why. I, of all the batteries I picked, I picked the only battery that was really low. Well, of course. No figures. That means we're going to have to go really fast. It keeps wanting to land. So I'm going to turn on the facial tracking mode. No, it really wants to land. It's like, I'm scared. I'm out of power. Dad, don't make me do this. Get up there, you. Make me proud, kid. It's like, no, please. I can't do it. All right, that figures. <laughs> It still has enough power for the camera, just not to actually retain flight. So you can see um, it's able to recognize all of you. And if its batteries weren't dead, it'd be chasing you around right now. It's got about eight minutes of life. So, um, you know, there's that uh, joke in English about you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your friend. <laughs> so just substitute drone, bear, and you're good. All right. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of fun. So that's GoCV. You can check it out at GoCV.io. You can follow us on Twitter at GoCVIO. And uh, I have stickers. I have many, many stickers. So you can come and see me um, afterwards, probably during the coffee break, because I know there's another talk that's going to be right after this, um, probably like literally as I'm packing up. Um, also, check out new project, TinyGo. 
You can actually run Go on microcontrollers now. This is not even a release project. Literally, this shakes everything. Like everyone who's talked in this room today, including me, has nothing compared to how important this project is. Check out tinygo.org. If you want to see more cool Go CV stuff, Dennis here is giving a talk at 12.45 tomorrow, which is actually going to show applications using Go CV in production. And uh, one last thought. Humanity is acquiring all of the right technologies, but for all the wrong reasons. At least that's what Bucky Fuller said, Buckminster Fuller. He wrote a really important book uh, in the late 70s called Utopia or Oblivion, The Prospects for Humanity. And uh, Fuller was a futurist and an inventor uh, way, way ahead of his time. He saw even then that our global communications, economic, social, health, Food production, all of these systems would become interconnected. So uh, you can see where he was looking. So let me just ask you, I've, I've shown you a lot of very advanced technology. What are you going to use it for? Are you going to use it to exhaust our resources in search of dreams that could never come to be because they were duplicates of other dreams? Are we going to use them as tools of oppression and control and restriction? Or are we going to use them as tools of liberation? It's up to you. What will you decide? Thank you. Actually, we do have some minutes for questions. So. Just out of curious, why do you use an exec of the FFmpeg instead of uh, splitting your video stream under the frames using GoCV? Uh, so the question is, why am I using uh, FFmpeg to do the decoding? Um, the reason is, is that don't currently have an H.264 encoder that I could figure out how to use with the extra envelope information that's in the drone. So the drone doesn't just standard just use a standard video stream. That would be too easy. I guess, you know. Um, instead, it has some extra envelope info. So you have to be able to strip out these bytes, put together the video packet, and then feed that into GoCV in order to do the analysis. So supposedly, there is a way to do this um, using something called GStreamer. So GStreamer is a separate command line utility, which is used for code, uh, encoding and decoding of video streams. It's got a very bizarre syntax. It's super powerful. But I um, haven't mastered the exact syntax needed to do this magical reassembly step. But once I do, then I can remove that piece. And probably the last, do you know you're in, in a restricted fly zone here in the Florence? Shh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Don't make, don't kick me out of the EU. I like it here. <laughs> Other questions? How far are you with implementing all the functions So the question is, how far are we along in writing all of the different wrappers that are needed in GoCV for the, all of the enormous amounts of functionality in OpenCV? So uh, we chose not to generate them. There were several attempts to generate these wrappers. That's how the Python wrappers work. And the code to generate the wrappers is a serious sub-project of its own. And uh, there actually were several attempts to do this with other uh, Go wrappers around OpenCV. And everybody just failed. I tried the same thing myself for almost a year. Finally, I kind of gave up for a few months. And it wasn't until I, kinda, I had the epiphany that we could write a wrapper function, hand write a wrapper function in idiomatic Go in maybe, let's just say it takes a whole hour. That is substantially less than how long it took the team of graduate students and postgraduates to come up with the computer vision algorithm in the first place. So OpenCV, as rapid as its development is, is much, much slower than our ability to hand write wrappers. So if everybody sort of picks up and carries one brick, over, then we build a whole cathedral. And uh, it turned out that much of the functionality in OpenCV, nobody really uses. 
I mean, someone used it at some point, but right now it's not part of that core active. So we can tell what parts people need because they submit a GitHub issue saying, hey, I couldn't find this. Our reply is, yes, it's not in there yet. Check in here for our contributing guidelines and here for our roadmap because we've gone through and literally listed out every one of these functions that, well, not every single one, but all the ones where we've started working in that OpenCV module. That way, if you wanted to add something or you want to use something, it's not there. You find it on the roadmap. We've tried to help you come along with whatever is necessary to then contribute that patch. And actually, uh, we were over 40 contributors. So uh, uh, something's working fairly well. And part of it is that people really want to use Go and OpenCV together. So we're just trying to help everybody scratch our mutual itch. Any other questions? Yes? So um, the question is, will this actually become part of the official OpenCV? Um, probably not, only because um, you know Go is really important to us, and, and you know we think that Go for embedded vision systems is really great. But it was a really painful process to get JavaScript into OpenCV. Like they went through multiple Google Summer of Codes just to get to that point. It's a very large extended team. There's a lot of opinions. You know, we're, we're able to take advantage of all this fantastic work without really forcing our own opinions upon them by having a separate project. If they wanted to do that, sure, but I'm not really sure if that would actually be helpful or if it might be you know, more of a hindrance to them and to ourselves. But a good question. Thank you, Ron. Sorry.